Hey, so today's topic is one that's near and dear to my heart, unfortunately. So um, Epstein Barr is a huge deal, especially in women's health care. And it's one of the things I don't feel like is investigated nearly enough, or if it is, it's really not managed very well, especially if you fall into the category that we're going to talk about today, which is a chronic Epstein-Barr infection and not necessarily the acute form of the infection. So what we're going to talk about today is what is Epstein-Barr, right? Where does it come from? What does it do? How do you test for it? What symptoms would you have that might make you think that you have a chronic Epstein-Barr infection? And I'm gonna give you some tips on things that you can start doing to support a chronic infection and tell you where to go from there. So if you don't know, Epstein-Barr is the virus that causes mono. So in its acute form, Epstein-Barr is mono. Now here's the biggest misconception. That doesn't mean for it to be problematic in your body, you have to currently have mono. I'll explain that a little bit more. And most people who have even large chronic Epstein-Barr infections typically have no idea they ever had mono. That was my story. When I found out that this was one of my major root cause issues, I was talking with my mom and she's like, you've never had mono. Oh, uh, I did, <laughs> whether we knew it or not, I obviously had to of at one point. But let me explain first, a lot of times even mono goes undiagnosed because to investigate and to find if you have mono, it takes a blood draw looking for Epstein-Barr. But what happens is Epstein-Barr virus and strep bacteria co-infect a lot of the time. Some of the research says over 82% of the time, Epstein-Barr and mono are at the same time. So typically what happens, and I'm certain this is what happened with me, is if you've had chronic strep bacterial infections, so maybe you've had strep throat a lot when you were younger, maybe you had strep infections in your gut, typically you'll go to the doctor because a strep infection and mono have really similar symptoms, right? In their acute form, you have the sore throat, you're tired, your lymph nodes are swollen. So if you go to the doctor and they swab you for strep bacteria and it comes back positive, typically they just stop there, right? Oh, yep, you feel sick because you have strep, here's your antibiotic, go home. If you are the person who that has happened to, but maybe you did a round of antibiotics and it came back, or it kept coming back, or you had reoccurring strep infections, likely you also had Epstein-Barr, but maybe they just never did the blood draw to confirm that. So I'm certain that was my issue because I had lots of different strep bacterial issues when I was younger and I would always be treated with antibiotics, which knowing now I wish I wouldn't have done, but that's all we knew to do when I was little. And they never tested me for Epstein-Barr. I don't think I was ever actually tested. So certainly I had it because it wasn't properly treated and it was able to become this chronic issue that really caused a lot of problems. So what happens is you get the acute version of Epstein-Barr, which is mono, right? But then typically you heal from that, right? You get over it, you don't have mono forever, but Epstein-Barr virus is very reactive, right? It's quite similar to something like a herpes virus or a varicella zoster, where you can reactivate these infections later in life. So you have mono, let's say when you're 16, whether you knew it or not, right? Had strep bacteria, had mono, you get over it. And then in times of hormone fluctuation or stress, these viruses reactivate. So I'll tell you my exact story and tell me if this sounds familiar to you is I was always sick growing up, right? Had the strep bacteria, did the antibiotics all through high school. And then I get to college, right? If you went to college, you know, it's not the most healthy environment, right? Eating crappy food, staying up late, studying, going out on the weekends, doing all that stuff. I started to develop chronic fatigue. I started to develop anxiety. I started to get all these other symptoms that I couldn't really pinpoint to a certain anything, right? So for me, looking back, that was the first time my Epstein-Barr reactivated. I'm certain of it because I could feel just that heaviness, right? Typically when your Epstein-Barr virus reactivates, you get chronic fatigue. It can cause migraine headaches. It can cause joint pain. It can cause a lot of unexplained just feeling heavy, feeling badly when there doesn't seem to be a reason or an explanation, right? That was me all through college. I could never figure out why I always felt so bad. But then I would go into a season where I felt a little bit better. I would go three months, I would go six months, I would go a year sometimes feeling pretty good. And then something else would happen. So going to get my doctorate, 
very stressful, right? A lot of late nights, a lot of pressure. All of a sudden those same weird symptoms would pop up and I just felt like I couldn't get a handle on my health. I was exhausted. I was getting migraines again. My joints were hurting. My anxiety was coming back. Couldn't figure it out. Tried to do all the right things, right? I was eating right. I was exercising. I was taking my vitamins and it just felt like nothing really would help. And then I would go into a season that I felt a little bit better again, right? So I was like, great, this is awesome. We would go about our day. We would keep doing our stuff. And then we opened a business, stressful, happened again. Then we had babies, stressful, hormone fluctuations, it happened again. So if you've had that pattern in your life where you feel like it goes up and down, right? Like there's really seasons that you feel really bad, and then some seasons that you're like, you know, I felt a little bit better. And then it comes back and you don't really feel like there's a rhyme or reason, that is very classic of a chronic reactivating Epstein-Barr infection. So that's kind of sign one, if you think this might be something going on with you, is those ups and downs and symptoms and that your body really feels like it crashes in times of stress or hormone fluctuations like pregnancy, postpartum, menopause, around your cycle if you feel really bad, all of those are signs of a reactivated virus. Now also with Epstein-Barr, it has some kind of specific things that it can create. Scientifically, it's really been linked to thyroid issues, specifically Hashimoto's. If you didn't know, a chronic Epstein-Barr infection is actually the number one root cause, number one of Hashimoto's thyroid. So if you have the autoimmune version of hypothyroid, likely, very likely, Epstein-Barr is the cause. It is also linked to chronic fatigue and fibromyalgia, the root cause of those types of things, which I have been diagnosed with fibromyalgia since I was eight years old. So I'm pretty certain I got likely my first exposure to Epstein-Barr very young, and we just didn't know. And then it also can create a lot of hormone or adrenal issues. So fatigue issues, heaviness, feeling you can never get your energy up, that really ties to a chronic Epstein-Barr infection. So those would be some kind of links. If you have any of those issues and have not been able to get a good handle on them, likely there's Epstein-Barr as a root cause. So how do you check for that, right? So it does require a blood test, but here's the difference is medically, right? If you go to your general practitioner, if you go to your doctor and you ask them to check you for Epstein-Barr, they're gonna check you for one value. And that's called your IgM titer, which is only checking if you right now, this moment have mono, right? So for most of you that will come back negative and they'll say Epstein-Barr is not your problem because you don't have this IgM titer for Epstein-Barr. But just because you don't actively have mono right now does not mean that Epstein-Barr is not part of the problem. There are actually four titers you need to test for to either rule it in or out. There's your IgM, there's your IgG, there's your early antibody, and there's your nuclear antibody. And now it's probably a little bit more sciencey than most of you need to know, but there's an algorithm that if certain ones are positive together, if the numbers of certain ones are high enough, you can really figure out if this is a virus that is continually reactivating and causing chronic long-term problems for your health, not just making you feel crummy for a couple of weeks with mono, this is the long-term stuff. This is what can be the cause of autoimmune issues, of fibromyalgia, of chronic pain, of joint issues. Like this is a big deal. And so few people have any idea if this is their root cause or not. So I highly recommend if you have any chronic issues that you just haven't been able to pinpoint the cause and you haven't looked at Epstein-Barr, this is huge. And I actually find it really fun. There's a lot of other people starting to talk about this more and more. For years, there was nothing out about chronic Epstein-Barr. And now it's becoming more kind of mainstream to look at this as a cause. And I love it because most people are going to have some form of this virus as part of their chronic issues. So definitely figuring out if you have the titers for Epstein-Barr, which ones you have, and then I cannot stress this enough. <laughs> you have to go to a practitioner who understands this type of an issue. Because if you take it to your general practitioner and you're hoping they're going to fix you, if this isn't what they do, this isn't what they've researched, if they don't understand the chronic version of Epstein-Barr, just because you know you have it, isn't going to fix anything, right? You need somebody who understands the process to fix it. And I'll tell you, it's not a simple, 
process, right? It's one of those things that there's going to be layers of things that you have to take care of. So now I'm gonna teach you guys things you can do to start healing if you do have a chronic Epstein-Barr infection, but some of what I'm gonna teach is gonna to have to be person specific because the way my body responded to the Epstein-Barr virus might be completely different than the way yours did. So all recommendations need to be individual, but I'm gonna teach you the things that I look for, what you can start doing, but knowing that you're really gonna need some one-on-one -on -one instruction if it turns out that this is something that you have. So the first thing that's important to know is it's not necessarily the fact that you have the chronic Epstein-Barr virus in your body that's the problem. It's the way that your body had to adapt to the pressure and the stress of that virus that create the problems, right? So the, the virus is just the trigger. It is the thing making your body irritated, but the way your body responds is what makes your chronic health issues. For example, for me, the way my body responded to a chronic virus is it gave me a thyroid issue, right? My thyroid was responding to the environment. So my thyroid hormones tanked. My adrenal glands, because they had to take the stress of this virus, remember, you're always looking for why your body responded a way that it did, right? So for me, because day in and day out, my body had to deal with this viral load, my adrenals got tired, right? They were managing this stress. They were managing the inflammation for decades for me. I mean, I easily had it for two decades before I ever actually was properly tested for it. My adrenals were tired. They were sick of fighting, right, all day long. So I ended up in adrenal fatigue. I ended up with very low hormones because when you have adrenal fatigue, your body will actually decrease your hormone production. So at 28 years old, when I was finally tested for Epstein-Barr, I also had menopausal ranges of estrogen and progesterone. No wonder I felt awful. No wonder I was exhausted. But those were the ways that my body had to adapt to this chronic virus. It started shutting things down. It shut down my hormones, it shut down my adrenals, it shut down my thyroid. And if I would have went to a traditional doctor, and again, don't get me wrong, I always get messages. Well, there's a place for both. I totally understand that. I'm not saying traditional doctors are terrible. I'm saying this is not what they do, which is why it takes decades like me, or even more. I have women who this has probably been going on 40, 50 years by the time they really figure out their answers. This is just not part of what they do. So let's say with that exact same situation like me, I went to a medical doctor and they ran some labs and they said, oh yeah, you do have low thyroid hormone. Here's your thyroid medication. You do have low hormones. Here's some bioidenticals. Although those medications can change my numbers, right? We could draw my blood again and my numbers would look better. If I never identified why, my hormones were tanked, why my thyroid was tanked. If I never figured out why, do you think even getting on those medications, I would feel tremendously better and everything would go back to normal? Nope. <laughs> so if that's you and you've tried the medication or they've wanted to medicate you and it just doesn't feel right or you don't feel a whole lot better, it's because you're treating the number, right? You're treating the way your body adapted to the problem, but you've never actually fixed the problem. So guess what? It is going to keep coming back. And that was me for 20 years. I kept trying to fix a problem. I tried trying to add another medication or another supplement or another thing I could do to try and fix the way I was feeling when in fact, none of that really helped at all long-term until I figured out my root causes. And I had more than just the Epstein-Barr, but that was one of the biggest things that when I finally got a handle on that, my whole life changed, my whole health changed. So I understand very much the frustration of having chronic issues for years. But once you find that answer, it is so fun to start understanding, oh, I get why my body was doing that, right? So you need to find that root, root answer. I'm telling you, if you have not investigated Epstein-Barr, this really could be it. This could be your breakthrough answer. So I'd be really curious to see what that looks like for you. So from that point forward, once you find out, like, okay, yes, I have a chronic Epstein-Barr infection, what do you do from there, right? So one very small piece of the puzzle is to actually treat the virus. We do need to do that, but that's only one piece of the puzzle. So a lot of the things that I read online, or if you look it up, it'll tell you a bunch of things that you can do to reduce your viral load, and that's great, but what 
they forget or what I don't often see talked about is then you also have to go back in and support the tissues and the areas of your body that have had to adapt to that viral load. So the first thing you'll do is, is you can actually do some really great antivirals. Now, depending on your levels and what titers are positive for you, I'm very particular about the things that I would recommend for somebody if they have a chronic Epstein-Barr infection. So some of that does have to be individual specific based on your labs. But I will tell you three things that I love specifically for Epstein-Barr that are generally safe for everybody because they're just really great adaptogens and they have really great antiviral properties. So one of the first ones I talked about last week is called monolaurin. Monolaurin is antiviral, it's antifungal. There's a lot of research showing it's very effective for Epstein-Barr and herpes virus and varicella, zosters. So it's great for a lot of those kind of heavy hitting viruses. So monolaurin is a great antiviral that you can start to use to reduce your viral load. The second one is reishi mushroom. I love medicinal mushrooms. I think they're so effective for a lot of different reasons and generally very safe for most people, right? They're not really forceful to the body. So reishi mushroom in particular has more antiviral properties and helps with Epstein-Barr. So that would be a great one. And then a really simple one is also colloidal silver. It's antiviral, it helps just decrease the amount of viral load you have, which is also generally safe. Now with silver, I'll get this question a lot too, you just have to make sure you have a good quality, right? Because if you look up colloidal silver and it says it could turn you blue, yeah, if you drink a bunch of really low quality silver with huge particles, there is a potential to have that, but you want a really good silver hydrosol with particles that are more absorbable to the body. So just make sure you're getting a good quality of silver and then you don't have the risk of those types of things. In fact, the stories that come of that were people who made their own silver from metal and drank it and turned blue. Well, yeah, don't do that, <laughs> buy a good one. Um, and we use coil silver for all kinds of stuff for me, for my family. I really very generally safe as long as you get a good quality. So those would be three things for specifically the viral load, monolaurin, reishi mushroom, and silver. But then you have to investigate how your body adapted, right? So the areas that I always look at, if I know that somebody had a chronic Epstein-Barr infection, immediately we are checking hormones and adrenals. We are checking a full thyroid panel, which means way more than just your TSH, right? We have to verify if there's any autoimmune, if there's Hashimoto's, if there's any of your other thyroid hormones that have had to adapt. So a full thyroid panel, and then I'm always doing a comprehensive stool sample because when you've had a chronic infection, it can alter and change your microbiome in your gut. It can make more room for other infections. And remember in the beginning, I said strep bacteria, and Epstein-Barr co-infect a lot. So it is very common when I see somebody with a chronic Epstein-Barr infection, they also have a chronic strep bacterial overgrowth in their gut because they really like to live together. So truly the way that you actually get through, right? Heal, become a healthy, vibrant, energetic person with a chronic Epstein-Barr infection is to yes, take care of the virus, but you've got to make sure that you're protecting all of the other areas that the virus could have damaged or created imbalance so that you are rebuilding new healthy cells, healthy tissues, and not allowing that virus to reactivate. So I know that was a lot of information. This is something I feel really passionate about. So many people are struggling and the Epstein-Barr virus is the root cause for a lot of those people and they've just never been checked properly. So if you have more questions, if you want a little bit more clarity, shoot me a message, um, just comment or shoot me a message and we can go back and forth and I can teach you a little bit more because it's more in depth than just what I can cover on a video. But I'm telling you, if you have chronic issues, if you've been struggling a long time and you have not checked into a chronic Epstein-Barr infection, whew, I'm telling you, this could be it, this could be your breakthrough. So shoot me a message. Give me a comment. I hope you learned something today. Thank you guys for listening and we'll have some more great stuff next week.